Okay, guys. Hello. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad that you're all here, uh, interested in a subject uh, that is always alive, that is going be, to be alive for uh, many, many years. Uh, my name is Jacek Milewski. Uh, I'm doing uh, mostly backend Java development uh, since a few years. Um, and uh, currently in a Circle K, uh, where we do a meaningful, very interesting software, very interesting business domain. We are uh, doing fuel, retail, and also electric vehicles uh, related stuff. So pretty interesting business. Uh, and uh, there I met a group of people, and this one particular person that uh, led me to, to the delivering the topic that I'm going to present you. And this is automated tests, and a pretty catchy title, title right? Uh, like uh, like a clickbait. But what, I, what is it about? I'm going to show you the approach that uh, uh, is a compilation of uh, approaches from many sources, from uh, conference speeches, from books, from tutorials, from experience, uh, from personal experience. Uh, it was the most affecting factor. Uh, so we'll be discussing automated tests. This is a subject that is present on a conference since many, many years, and it's still up to date because the ecosystem is changing. So we still meet a new class of classes of problems that we need to test. So it's still an important topic to deliver software at a quality. It's not a you know, challenge to deliver software, it's a challenge to deliver it at a quality. Uh, there are many approaches to test your systems, uh, and there are many approaches to do it well, in fact, because uh, you know it depends on a class of a problem. Uh, we'll be doing live coding. Uh, so here, here is my GitHub uh, account uh, with the link to the source code. It is already there. Uh, it will be live coding, right? So it will be really, uh, really on. Uh, we'll making, we'll be making our hands dirty. So the. Goal of this presentation, there's just one goal, is just to show you one of the options, one of the tools that you can use uh, when you're going to uh, test your system, to test your business application, uh, to test the, if it is delivering the business features that you expect it to deliver. So I'm just going to show you uh, how does it all start, right? When we're learning the unit testing. I'll be focusing mostly on the unit testing. I'll be discussing what is the unit, but also, as a complementary, I'll also mention the, the integration testing as uh, uh, also a requirement to test the system well. So how does it all start? We'll start with the basic. The example will be complete. It will be very simple, very small, but complete. It will present all the, the whole idea that I want to show you. Uh, so I had to figure out the, the case uh, that we'll be discussing. So the business rule, business domain, business requirement is to calculate rating for the person. We know the person's age. Uh, rating is uh, an estimate how much do we trust this person. If we want to assign him a credit card or uh, give him a loan, how much do we trust him, right? It, so the, the algorithm will be very simple. The older the person is, the more that we trust him. Uh, so we'll be simply doubling the H here. This is the algorithm, so H times two. Uh, and uh, I have also the test prepared. This is the unit test where I construct this service that is doing this calculation, uh, initializing it in a setup. Uh, and I have a first test that is going to test if calculate returns rating. Yeah, and this is the tool, right? This is uh, the first step when you're approaching the unit test. You're learning a tool. This is a JUnit in this case. Uh, so in the unit, yeah, I'm going to assert that this result is equal to what I actually expect. So in this case, if person is 23 years old, I expected the result to be 46. So when I have the test, I can run it to see that it's red because implementation is not yet ready, right? We're expecting 46 and have zero. Fix is very simple, it's to write 46 here, right? Uh, let's uh, uh, skip this for the demo purposes. Uh, let's uh, write the algorithm uh, uh, straight away. 
in real life, I would do something similar to writing 46, maybe not in this, that simple example, but just to add more test cases. Uh, okay, so now um, tests are green. We're very happy, we know the tool. We know how to write assertions, how to write unit tests. We have the, our first unit test, in fact, running, and it's green, so yeah, we're satisfied. Uh, very rarely we have this case that we have uh, the class that is living on, it, on its own on, uh, without any dependencies. So we have sometimes dependencies, right? Uh, I call it an internal dependency. Uh, I'll show you in a moment why internal. Uh, so I'm going to jump quickly to a new branch uh, where a new class will appear. And this class is a Calc Validator. Uh, so Calc Validator is, in fact, uh, validating a user's age. So if it is adult, if not, then we do not trust this person at all, so we return rating equal to zero. So in Calc service, we will inject uh, with a constructor this Calc Validator, and we are going to use it here how our tests changes. Uh, well, yeah, we have to somehow provide this Calc Validator. Uh, I procrastinate the decision what it will be uh, to later. And I have two <coughs> test cases, right? I'm going right now to calculate the rating for adult, which should be exactly the same like it was, and for not adult, which should return zero. So, yeah. Uh, since we are learning uh, unit testing, we are fascinated with mocking. Uh, we discover mocking, so I'm going to inject mock here. Uh, so calc validator class and it's mock. So let me run those tests now uh, to see what is happening. Uh, and in fact, one test passes still, um, and one uh, does not. So not adult is not passing because we still not have implemented this logic. But why this test is green? I wanted to have a validation in place, right? So if it is green, it means that I don't have this validation because even if Calc Validator is not yet used in my service, the test is green. So I can do this one small thing. I can verify if Calc Validator was called uh, with age of 23. Uh, I can do the same for the second test. So the, for the three-year-old three -year person, I'm going to run those tests once again, and now they should be both red because uh, something was wanted but not invoked. Okay, uh, so let me just uh, enable this test to pass. I'm, I need to uh, mock the behavior of this validator. So let's do it. Uh, we know the new framework, so let's use it. So for the person of age 23, it should return as a, a true, as a valid person. So we can calculate rating for this person. Okay, and for the three-year-old person, it should return false. And with this test setup, uh, I can run my tests to confirm that they are still red and implement the logic here. The implementation will be very simple. I'm going to add this if statement and pass uh, the age as a parameter. And that's it, in fact. Uh, else I'm going to return a rating equal to zero. Now the test should be green. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have it. Right? We have a new tool. We are we know what are mocks, and we know how to use them, and we know how to write tests with mocking. And now I'm going to stop, because we're moving to, towards the, the clue of this presentation. Uh, there are some issues in this code. I want to display them first, and later show them in a the code. Uh, just two issues. Uh, the first one is that test duplicates the implementation. So my test knows a lot about the implementation. Uh, and second case is uh, that we have we might have problems with refactoring this code, this production code, also the test code. Uh, while the test 
test should help us refactoring without uh, destroying things, without breaking things. In this case, uh, refactoring is difficult. Okay, so duplication, uh, duplicating the knowledge in uh, tests and tough refactoring. Why and how? Okay, so let's get back to our tests. Uh, first, let's start uh, with pretty soft problems. So we have this calc validator, which has a method age is valid. If I'm going to rename it, because I feel that it should be renamed in the future, uh, the changes will be reflected in many places. Let's say not age, but person is valid. Uh, so uh, right now I have also, this rename will be also reflected here in a service, which is natural because I'm using it here. So it's very natural. But also, it will be reflected in test, which is not that natural, right? Uh, so I have more files where this rename will be visible, which is a very good way to hide this dirty hack in a pull request, right? If you, if you have uh, changes in 50 files, then probably your reviewer won't notice the dirty, the dirty hack that you did in this small place. But this is not very uh, good if you have a pull request that uh, where simple rename is taking a lot of attention during the review. Uh, so this is the first issue. I'm going to revert uh, this to name it edge is valid. Uh, the second level of problems uh, is uh, that in, in this case, uh, input params for validators are exactly the same as input params for uh, the accessor method. So what will happen if there, is, there will be something more and this X will be calculated here by some strange algorithm. So yeah, here this is simple, this is obvious, but what should I do in my tests? What should I inject here? Should it be any int? Or should it be maybe some magic number, exactly the same? But, but we don't like magic numbers, right? So maybe it should be something named. So it's not that, uh, it's not that magic, right? So uh, we're clear, but nevertheless, does it does it have any meaning for your tests? If you give here one two three four, what does it mean? If you gave it one two three four, so uh, does it influence the test result somehow? Uh, so is is this really that important that I have to write it here? So for me, uh, when I will be reading this tense, test. Uh, after one month, then probably I will have to stop and think what uh, this variable means and what was the intention one month ago. Okay, so, uh, so this was a bit uh, harder. And the hardest thing is what if my validations rule will change? Uh, what if uh, right now valid age is 28 years. So this is where the duplication of knowledge uh, strikes you the most hard, the hardest. So um, in our tests, I'm pretending then f that for 23 year old person, I should return true while my production logic has changed, right? So right now, this is the, the uh, we are seeing right now the benefits of mocking, but we're also seeing the threats uh, of mocking, right? So we have a different case in a test code uh, than in on production. And it's very tough to, uh, to spot during the tests because, well, I have changed uh, the implementation in validator. So let's say uh, that on pull request, nobody will notice that also in some unrelated test, uh, this, this change should also be done, right? To, to 29, for example. So my tests begin to lie. Uh, and we tend to agree that the unit test might lie because the, those are unit tests, right? Those are not, uh, we have different, another uh, levels of testing, but do they have to lie this much or they can maybe lie a bit less? So let's uh, change it to 18 years again. 
Uh, and let's see uh, whether we can do something with those issues. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, so the first uh, thing that I'm going to recommend is to decide what is my unit. Uh, does it have to be a class? Uh, why do I use mock on this level? Why do I, uh, well, in fact, I agree with myself that this will be a point where uh, something may lie, right? Some, somebody, somebody could change uh, the implementation in production code, but forgot to change uh, the tests. So tests behave differently than a production implementation. So why do we use mocks here? Maybe we should switch to using uh, real implementations, right? So my unit is not a calc service. It's not a service. It's not a single class. It's not a single file. Files are so artificial, right? Uh, our language and our, uh, let's say, the, the possibilities of our mind uh, force us to split the big parts into smaller parts, into files, right? But this is not how business works. So the, the feature is delivered by a group of files, not by a single file. So my unit is not a file. It's not a service file. It's not a file editor file. My unit is a um, set of files. So if I change uh, the implementation from mock into calc validator, into new, real implementation, they ca then I can remove all those mockings. And I can remove this verify, yeah. So all of you that felt this pain when I was adding verify, now it's better. Uh, and also I'm going to remove the mocking here because this is not a mock now. I'm going to run the test and they should be uh, green. Yeah, so, so uh, I'm testing the business behavior right now. I'm not testing the service class, I'm testing the business behavior, which is consisted, which is consisted of a group of classes, not a single class. Okay, uh, so I'm moving towards the, uh, some kind of group of files, as I named it. I'm going to name it a module. Uh, a module is a, as a group of classes uh, to serve a business needs. Uh, a, module, a module has an API. A module exposes its behavior through an API. So let's see uh, how this API might look like. Right now, my API is de facto the service, right? It has one method, which is not private. It's, it's package private, uh, but probably it's going to be public. Uh, so just the one method. So let me uh, simply s uh, switch uh, branch uh, from a uh, Not that much has changed, except that new uh, annotation has appeared, which is right now just a marking annotation. It's doing nothing. Uh, it will be uh, doing some more things later, but my Calc service is going to be my API, so let's explicitly call it an API. Right? I want to be able to uh, know whether this is some service or API just by looking at a file name. Okay, to be even more uh, explicit, I am going to annotate it with module API. So now it looks better, but still my API, I want it to be the facet to, to internal implementations. So the facet and API shouldn't be that much complicated. You know that uh, in real life in services we have a lot of logic, a lot of code, a lot of private members, right? So I don't want to have it in my API. So I'm going to uh, keep my API classes as uh, just as a facet. Uh, so I'm going to delegate all the code, all the calls uh, to services. So I'm, do, I'm creating a class right now, Calc service, where I'm going to delegate all the calls, um, all the calls uh, that are called to, to the API. And as you see, I have one line here. Right now my API is doing nothing except of delegating. Uh, this is IntelliJ uh, refactoring uh, issue, so I'm going to, of course, not construct the service here. It will be injected. And let's take a look at our calc service. The calc service 
has a private member calc validator and yeah, it will have also OLARX constructor. Uh, so to, to be able to inject the calc validator and it doesn't have to be public. Right? Uh, it still will be in the same package. Um, and yeah, so the service looks uh, like that. We, we know it, right? We've seen this. So this is my API. So the unit, my unit right now is not going to be the class, it's going to be the API. My API will be my unit. So a group of classes, uh, a set of files uh, that are going to serve uh, and deliver the business functionality and that expose an API. So my unit is a module that exposes an API. Uh, so, of course, uh, we need to group somehow those classes, right? It, it can be grouped in, a manu in many ways. Uh, it can be a bounded context, an aggregate, it can be uh, a package, uh, it can be a module from Java 9. So, you name it, you know your system the best, uh, but you have to group it somehow. And uh, grouping it uh, in, a, let's say, technically oriented packages is not a good way, right? So right now here you have the services, the, the DAOs, the entities, the APIs. It's not a good way. Uh, we're grouping it uh, in a module which is named, in a package module, however you call it, which is named Calct and its, re its role is to deliver the calculations. Right? We have API services and validators inside. Okay, so my API right now is a single entry point for my, for my module, and this is what I test. It exposes an API, public API, and this is what I test. Uh, API internally can call the service, or many services, if it's more complex. Services can call other classes, but it doesn't matter for my unit test. The one thing that matters is that it exposes an API. Uh, does it work on production? Yes. Uh, so it's not only working on demo. I, uh, this is an, uh, a snippet from my production code uh, where we have a module named TC from terms and conditions where we are versioning terms and conditions, checking what user has accepted, what not. Uh, and as you see, we have four services here. So this is pretty big API and we are simply delegating all the calls to our services. And um, module unit tests, so if we have this module, uh, again, I'm moving away from uh, this uh, constraint that files uh, are something meaningful. So files are not meaningful. So how I test this API, I have one test file per one API method. So not for the whole API class, just one test file per one API uh, behavior or method. So for this API, I have uh, around 10 files, which are, of course, named uh, using some conventions. So the name of the API, the name of the behavior that is, that is tested, and the suffix. Uh, inside the files, I'm testing all the edge cases. So uh, I also name the behavior and test all the edge cases that might happen in this API. I'm not starting the application context. It's still uh, not using any framework, so it's running fast. So it's still unit test, right? It's fast. Uh, but um, you might have noticed already that it's not always that simple. Uh, we can't uh, test. Um, uh, we can't test our whole systems system uh, with uh, as a single module, right? We might have multiple modules. And in this case, I'm going to present you how uh, should the interaction between modules should, could look like in my case. So uh, a new module has uh, appeared. Again, I'm changing the branch, but in, in fact, nothing, not very much has changed. Uh, apart that, yet another validation or verification has appeared. We have a user API, which is as you know, as a, if I call something an API, then this is a module API. So this is something that I trust that somebody has already tested uh, as a module, a unit test. Uh, so I'm going to use it, and it has uh, yet another verification of user based on its age. 
So what do I do in a test uh, in this case? Well, in this case, I'm using mocking. So this is where uh, my module has its boundaries, where my unit test has its boundaries. So as I said to you before, we can trust our tests up to the level where mocks appear. So this is where is the limit of, uh, of my trust. So I trust that I uh, have my calc API tested. Uh, but uh, here is the mocks, right? So here is the moving part. So this is why, where I agree that uh, these errors m might occur. But I have my whole module tested. Okay, and here, of course, uh, the, the mocking appears, right? So I mock that user API verify user will return false, and I test the behavior of my module here. So that's it when it uh, comes to the uh, external modules. But we have yet another uh, external dependency, let's say, which is a database. Uh, and database is a bit different than external modules, because let's say that external modules are totally basic, right? We write them, they depend, the implementation depends on our business rules, business needs, but the database in most cases is pretty similar, right? Uh, so um, mocking it might be a bit more cumbersome. So let's switch to the branch where the repository appears. And yeah, the, the business uh, requirement right now is to save each calculation in a database, save it in a repository. So I have extracted the perform calculation method as a private member. It's doing nothing more than previously. And now I have a room to add uh, this persistence, right, to save this calculation in a database. So let's see what uh, should I do in my tests. Okay, uh, so my repository is right now nothing, uh, so I just want to keep it nothing for a few more seconds. It's injected into Calc service, right? So uh, as it requires repository, I'm injecting it here. And we have a new test case that calculate behavior is pers does persist rating, in fact. Okay, so what is my Calc repository? My calc repository uh, will be in a production code. It is a crude repository, simple. A crude repository is a, uh, if you're familiar with Spring, has just a basic implementations of crude methods, right? So delete, find, save, um, and some utils also. Uh, I don't need anything more right now in, for in this case, so in my test, I'm going to use new calc test repository. And what is the calc test repository? Uh, it is implementing the same interface, the calc repository, the same as in production, uh, and it's extending the in-memory repository which is uh, the CRUD repository again, right? So, so it has, we've been here a few seconds ago, right? It has all those CRUD methods. Uh, so how does it implement this interface? Well, hash map, yeah. So my database will be in memory. Uh, I will keep all the entities in a hash map. So I'm implementing those methods, right? So they are, the implementation is very simple, right? I'm saving. Uh, so putting the entity in the database, I'm finding, so returning all values uh, and uh, the methods that I'm not using, I'm going to throw an exception. I'm not going to pretend that I implemented it if I'm not using it. So uh, somebody that will need it probably will see this exception and have to implement it. Yeah, so the repository is in fact, the has the same interface as my production repository, uh, but uh, stores the data in a memory. So I don't have to, in my unit test, I don't have to uh, issue a connections to a database. I don't have to connect to any database. I don't have to have anything. It's, I want it to be fast. Okay, so how I'm going to assert it? Uh, so 
how I'm going to assert that uh, writing was persisted. I'm going to call my calc repository and I'm going to do it as simple as I can. So I'm just going to check if uh, it has one cal uh, calculation persisted. So uh, of course in real life I would do some more strict validation, but right now let's take that something was saved. Okay, and uh, the test is read uh, because expected size was one and, was, and the size actual is zero. So let's go to our service and yes, it, it has to be read, right? Because there is no implementation yet. So let's implement it. So let's save um, a new entity. This is a simple calc entity uh, that has uh, properties of age, which I'm going to take from the param and uh, the result of calculation, which I'm going to uh, take from the uh, result. And I'm going to run those tests once again to see that they are green. So something was truly saved in my database. Why I don't use mocks? Because a crude repository uh, is in most of the cases the same, right? So I don't have to write uh, mocking uh, for every test case in every test while it's still the same. So I have a common class uh, in memory repository that I'm extending. If I, if I have more repositories, then I simply uh, add more repository, test repositories into my tests, right? Uh, so yeah, that's it. This is how I cope with the repositories. So uh, we know where are the moving parts, right? So mock of external module is uh, the first moving part and the second moving part is the repository where I fake it. So uh, it works provided that I <laughs> wrote it well, right? But I don't have, I, I can't be sure. So this is where integration tests come in place. They're about to confirm that everything works well together. So let's see what my integration tests are doing. Uh, now we have a framework dependency. Yes, yeah, so we're starting Spring Boot application here. Uh, and we have a few annotations that has appeared, right? We have controller, which is REST controller. It's exposing a post under this address, uh, under, under this URL, and uh, it's returning a JSON with key result. Right now, the result is zero always, and it returns an entity. The repository became a repository right now. The entity is an entity. I'm going to use H2 database uh, for the demo purposes. And the service is, uh, uh, sorry, the API is still module API, but the module API annotation is right now a component. Right? So it's uh, simply uh, yet another name for a component, but more meaningful. Okay, and the integration test is here. So it starts the whole application on a port 1990. The rest assured uh, will be used and I have an auto-wired crowd repository here. So this is a real repository. This is auto-wired one. This is not faked. And I have uh, my first integration test. Uh, so let's see what my integration test is going to test. Uh, first of all, I'm going to confirm that my REST API is in fact exposed properly. Right? So I, I'm going to check if I received the status code. Second thing, I'm going to assert if this response has a valid body, if it in fact returns me the, the result that I was expecting. So I'm going to get integer from key of result and assert that uh, is equal to, uh, here I'm passing 24, so it should be 48, so double the age of the person. And yet another moving part, is to assert uh, that calc repository has this calculation uh, saved. So I'm going to find all the entities and assert that it has size of one. I'm going to run this test. This will be a bit slower because it is integration test. It's testing a bit more. So it's starting my framework. So very good. This is what I wanted to test. 
uh, it's red because um, well, I'm returning zero from my controller, right? Let's jump to the controller and use my API class, class here. So calc API, calculate rating uh, with a param of h and run, let's run those tests once again. Yeah, so those three lines um, are doing, in fact, what my integration tests are meant to do. Yeah? Confirm that API is exposed, that it's returning the result, and that the database integration is working. Uh, let's uh, get back to our slides to see some drawings, right? To see something uh, with the rectangles. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the calc API is the thing, and the module API, uh, the calc module is the thing that I test as a unit, as a module. Uh, and all the things apart from that, so database, controller, and HTTP, if it works together, I'm testing it with in the integration test. So here I'm confirming in the integration test that my REST API is exposed, that my API is secured, if there's any security, and all the fake and mocked dependencies are working as I expect. Also, if there are any, there are any exp ex exceptions, I'm checking if they are properly handled, right? So if I'm, that I'm not returning for 500, that I'm returning some meaningful status code and the error messages. And all of this is also documenting my contract, my API contract, right? This is still not the best way to uh, test the contract, but uh, uh, I mean that there are consumer-driven contracts, there are other tools you can use, but still it is good enough to test uh, that API contract and document it. Okay, so to uh, draw it in yet another way, uh, we have the scope of unit tests uh, displayed here as uh, an API, a thing that tests an API, the services and the repositories, the fake repositories. So the logic that lies in services is tested by a module tests. Uh, so if you have uh, logic in services, if you really have uh, complex logic in a services, this is the one of the approaches that you could use. Uh, if you have a crude application, probably you'll find out that these module tests are very simple because uh, well, there's no logic, right? So there's nothing to test uh, as a module test. So probably you should focus more on an integration test where you simply test your API and the behavior of your service, of your system. And you also confirm that controllers, so the REST API is exposed and the real database is in use as, and is working as you expect it to work. So how do you test your code? It's a very simple question that has very many answers. How many, how many integration tests do you have? How many unit tests do you have? How many micro tests do you have? It depends on the class of a system that you're building. Most of us probably are building the, the business serving applications. So we, I think that we are pretty in a similar situation, right? I've also mentioned here a micro tests, which is, for example, if you have a crude application, which is simply getting data and returning data, probably you have only parsers and validators, right? Maybe parsers and validators are the cases where the unit can be a single class, this parser class, right? So, so there's not, not that much interaction between, the, so the parser and validator are independent and they can be tested, unit tested, uh, where unit is a class, is a class. Uh, so yeah, I call it a micro test. And you can have also no tests, which, should, which probably uh, can be the hardest to explain why, why you don't test your code. Okay, so this was the strategy. Right? This was the approach to testing. So it's not that simple to, let's say, implement. Uh, so you cannot start tomorrow and have your tests written like that. But you can simply start to pick one class, pick one service, decide on one business domain, and simply move it to separate package and try to test it as a module, uh, as a group of classes, not as a single class. Uh, and another part is um, I want to emphasize the things uh, that I uh, was using during this presentation, but 
uh, right now I'm going to tell a bit more about it. Uh, so the first thing uh, the, is the convention that I use is the naming convention, right? So we are used to use the given when done uh, in uh, body. If you're using Spock for Java testing, you're in fact enforced to do it. If you're unit, using JUnit, I think that using comments, comments uh, in, a, in body is a convention. But what about the test name? So there's a lot of conventions, right? Even in the same file, you very often meet uh, a very different approaches to how to name this class. So for future me that will be reading this test uh, after one month, uh, it will be good to have some conventions. So if we have given one then in body, we have one then given in a test name. So first, I describe the behavior that I'm going to test. So calculate is my behavior. Right? Then I write what I expect. So then it, it should return rating. So a happy path, right? It should return valid rating. Given if there's, there are any meaningful conditions, uh, then I give it uh, at the end, right? So, so, uh, uh, so this is the convention. It's very, uh, very, very nice to use. Okay, the second thing uh, are the builders. So very often in tests, we need a value object, some entities, uh, something that uh, has several fields and has also several parameters in a constructors. But not all of those parameters uh, has meanings, meaning in uh, tests, right? Sometimes you simply don't care about two of, two of three parameters. You care about only the age, like here. You don't care about the others. Uh, so in tests, I use the builders. Uh, and uh, I assigned uh, default values to it. So when I'm reading the test, I know that only age matters, right? So there is some specific behavior that I'm going to test for the person that is 24 years old. And I'm building this entity. Uh, what's more, if I have builders, instead of building, I can say that I want to save it in, it in DB, in database, right? What in DB is doing, it's in fact building an entity first and later saving it in a repository. In what kind of repository? Is it a real repository or fake repository in memory, in memory one? It depends what I am going to inject here when I'm constructing a builder. Right? So I have the same approach uh, in a unit test as in an integration test. So I'm using the same API. So looking at this test, you can say what um, repository I'm using here, if it's a real one or in-memory one. So you don't have to switch contexts when you're switching from unit to integration test. Not having to switch context, it also means that you can simply copy unit test and make it an integration test because a different repository is injected there, right? So this is what I do very often because uh, in unit tests, I'm testing all the edge cases and for integration test, I pick two or three most uh, important ones and confirm uh, that in integration, the system also works. And the TDD, I'm, uh, as you've seen, uh, many times uh, during this live coding, uh, I've had read tests, right? because I don't trust tests that I haven't seen read, and I made them green afterwards. If test wasn't read, if it was always green, I don't have a proof that it, in fact, is testing something. Uh, like here, maybe you've already noticed what is wrong here. Uh, that there is no assertion in this line, right? Uh, this is a test with an assertion. And it's impossible to spot. So you have to see this test read uh, to know that it is testing. It's a very good way to improve your coverage, uh, writing a test without an assertion, but, uh, well, makes no sense, right? So in the first case, I was using, I was calling the is empty method on a array list, and in a second line, I'm calling uh, is empty on assert j. So I'm doing an assertion, in fact. Okay, and the last thing that I want to share with you is um, this uh, misconception about the 
speed of development and testing. Uh, very often we say that uh, something will take us more time to implement uh, because we have to add tests to, to test it, right? So uh, then, of course, there are ideas. So please do not write test for this feature, so it will be faster. Uh, so there is uh, this misconception that testing uh, sp uh, slows down the development, uh, which is totally opposite. Here, uh, we can see the speed that drops. It's my imaginated chart, of course. So uh, this is how I see it. Uh, if you're starting without writing test, so let's say that Red Team is starting a new project and this building the new features very fast at the beginning, right? But later something happens, uh, they can't build up the next features because they promised to the business that they are going to speed up a little bit uh, by skipping the tests. Uh, yep, so they, they were really fast at the beginning, but later they can't add new features at the same pace because they are breaking stuff that, uh, that was previously implemented. So um, here is the green team coming, right? The green team then that started already, uh, they started the project with uh, good tests from the beginning. Uh, yeah, and they were slower at the beginning because they had to do this setup, right? This test setup, the unit test, the integration test, the Jenkins, the CI, CD, the notifications, and all of this. But still, when uh, the, the next, next features, they, they have free, they can freely develop new features and they can safely add new features without breaking old features that are, that are already in place, right? And they meet somewhere here. Uh, and Red Team probably is searching right now what they did wrong and the green team just, just goes by. Uh, okay, uh, so that's it. That I, uh, that's everything that I wanted to present to you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to uh, hear your thoughts, hear your questions. If you have any questions, you can ask them right now. Uh, and please uh, rate, rate my talk in the application. Okay, do you have any questions? Okay, so I'm here still. Uh, you can approach me. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>